So welcome to my talk. It is entitled Forgotten Stories, Silenced Voices. And you'll see this emblem and it's from local artist Nadina Tandy, who's on um, Gibson, who lives uh, by Gibson's and she's illustrated my forthcoming book that Ishbel so kindly mentioned in her lovely introduction. And it's an amulet, it's a seed and my suggestion to you as historians, as community activists in history, I don't know each of you and your backgrounds, but you, I'm guessing, are members of either the Surrey Historical Association um, or the BC Historical Federation. And so I hope and invite you to think of this talk as planting seeds around this theme of forgotten stories and silenced voices. Ooh. And that was just me wanting to give thanks and honor to all of you, to the Federation, to the Surrey Historical Society. I love what you do. And I love how you're opening up to this theme of silence voices and forgotten stories. And there's me pre-pandemic, I might add. <laughs> I have some, I was training to be, um, way more fit than, than I am now. I have to get back into shape. I'm sure, well, I'm guessing some of you can relate. Um, all right, so my first book, as Ishbel said, is entitled Children of Air India. And it's, you know, the subtitle is blurry. I'm gonna read it out for you. Unauthorized interject, unauthorized exhibits and interjections. So you can just think about that a moment. Children of Air India, and then this subtitle, Unauthorized Exhibits and Interjections. And hopefully what's more clear is a fragment photo, I love fragments, from the archive that I had to create in writing this book. And you can see that to the left here. And I'll just give you a moment to be with what I'm showing you so you can take that in while I'm talking. So you will see that I've zeroed in in particular on some sources. There were 17,000 documents that I researched about the bombing of Air India Flight 182 that happened over 30 years ago that for a long time and even now wasn't really seen as anything to do with Canada. And this week of terrible reckoning uh, of the thing that has always been present, which is our treatment of indigenous people in Indian residential schools. You'll see I've bordered all my slides orange. Um, this theme I think that I'm speaking to is an immigrant citizen settler of um, silence voices, forgotten stories is so prevalent in, in, in what I'm sharing with you. And, you know, as an immigrant settler citizen, um, I'm very grateful to be a Canadian, and I'm very aware that this image we have of Canada the good, it is such a good place. I'm so grateful for Tommy T.C. Douglas and socialized medicine, and I don't want to live anywhere else. And also, it is a place of terrible happenings, just like every country. We have a shadow history of persecution and oppression from Dukabors to many others, but so fundamentally and not to equate them to our indigenous folks. And the Air India tragedy is but one strand of forgotten stories and silence voices. So I'm gonna really invite you as historians, as people who are working with history. So you're at this conference about history to consider the seed I'm planting about what is forgotten? What is not talked about? And in my family, there was this immense tragedy, this bombing that killed my aunt and uncle. But as a poet and a writer, I didn't want my book of poetry to just be confessional memoir. I wanted to situate it in history. And it was very important to me to write into this gap that I felt was in Canadian history. When I started writing this book, at the Writer Studio at SFU, which is a fabulous program for, for um, people who are working. It's, you know, you can work and get your certificate. Um, 
most people didn't really know what I was doing. And I got a lot of that. Um, I don't get it. And I got a lot of um, from very good people, by the way, who have gone on to be huge supporters. But, you know, initially there was this. Uh, I was trying all these different things of how to write history into poetry. And so one of the things I do is I would repeat the name of the incident, the day of the bombing, June 23rd. So this month, 1985. And most of us, I think, particularly because you're historians and we're of a certain age, you will know that date, even if maybe, you know, hopefully it's not top of mind. I hope it isn't for you. It is for me for obvious reasons, but it needn't be for you at all. You don't have to carry that. Um, but when I tried to sort of introduce these history bits, I got a lot of resistance. I, I got a lot of, I don't get it. And what is this? Whereas this was around 2013, when I would write about 9-11 and 9-11 gave me a language to even talk about Air India as a bombing, as an act of terror. Growing up, we never used these words. We barely talked, we just wanted to be good, well-behaved, conforming uh, Canadian citizens. My God, I still wanna be that person. You know, it's very hard sometimes when you experience this kind of trauma to even speak about it. And we didn't wanna be a bother. Isn't that so Canadian? I think things have radically shifted. But when I was writing this in the early oddies, I got a lot of resistance. And one of the, the things that I found was that I had to do a lot of digging to find the sort of stories I wanted to tell. And while I was doing that digging in the official record, I kept seeing this phrase in the woods outside Duncan. I had no idea what it meant, but it had an exercised a spiritual, mental, physical pull on me. It was kind of mysterious to tell you the truth. I'd never been to Duncan. I knew vaguely it was up island somewhere or mid island, I guess, Cowichan Valley. I didn't know very much about the First Nations history there. I was pretty ignorant. I kept hearing little bits of this in the woods outside of Duncan. Certainly it was mentioned in the, as I said, 17,000 documents that are the archive that is the history of the bombing of Air India and then our investigation. And then of course, one of the longest running trials and then the acquittal of the accused, a singularly terrible moment in my personal history and I would argue in Canadian history. So you will see, I hope that um, my hand is on some very particular things. There's representations of murdered and missing women that appeared in West Coast Line, which is a literary journal. And then there are these references to these books about a place named Paldi, where I actually went in 2011 in the woods outside of Duncan, off of Highway 18 at Hillcrest Road. And it was a game changer for me. So I'm just going to read um, this poem, which is an intertext poem of lines from all the documents that I adapted and changed into poetry, and I call it docu-poetics. And this is from the archive, The Weight. Everything was normal, oceans and recovery, intense speculation, partial inflation, 39.8% emotional effects, extent and severity, plastic sheeting a chain of command, an orderly fashion, 132. Everything was normal. Passengers and airlines, lines and comparison, volumes and discovery, cascading failure, attached to a limb, unidentified noise, numerous agencies, corrections, pending and requests, identified changes in lieu of documents, resource insufficiency, protracted and complex, necessary discussions, inadequate security, 
82 children under the age of 13. So all of those lines are taken from the historical record and I've arranged them, I reworded them, I made them into poetry and of course that terrible fact, it's just a fact, just like we're hearing this week about 215 children in the tragedy of the bombing of Air India, there were 82 children who perished under the age of 13. And hence the title of my book, Children of Air India, but also this idea that this sort of historical trauma makes us all children of it, even if we don't know about it, it affects us. Oh. I'm not going to read this next poem, um, but it gives you an idea. Again, this is from the records. I fictionalized the records. I didn't want identities directly known, but I really wanted to give elegies, respectful poems to the dead to recreate their lives. So this was a girl who's 12 years old. Um, she was going to Bombay. She was from Montreal to visit her relatives. And from the historical records, I juxtaposed Montreal and India because what I was trying to do, you know, without being too on the nose, was to give the reader the sense that this was a international South Asian Indian and Canadian tragedy. And the picture there, you'll recognize from the Fraser View Cemetery where my father is buried. Um, he was one of the first South Asian United Church ministers. And when this terrible incident happened in our life, he went to identify the bodies with my aunt and uncle from Toronto. Um, and it was my aunt and uncle from India who'd perished. My mother was too broken. I don't think she ever really recovered to go, but um, this is a place of real solace. And there's so much history in New Westminster. And I spent a lot of time in the New Westminster archives at Irving House there. I think they've moved now or will be moving. So um, now we get to this place, Paldi. And I really wanted to share with you and empower you in your roles in my pre-discussion with with Shannon and her team about this presentation and remember this idea of planting seeds, sometimes the official archives don't have a lot and they don't have a lot because, you know, as the cliche goes, history is written by the victors, the victorious, the people who are on the inside, not the outside. When we think about forgotten stories and hidden voices, if you go to the official um, sources, there's often very little there and that absence is haunting and important to pay attention to. And that's where local, smaller historical societies, for instance, for my book, the Cowichan Historical Society become hugely important. So your work is so important. And my goal today is to plant the seed that if all of you are activist historians, where you're culturally sensitive to silenced voices and forgotten stories, you will know, you will discern the power of keeping the records. You'll hear this with Indigenous people. Who keeps the records? of the stories that people don't want to talk about. There's a lot of vested power in not talking about these stories. So I remember I told her, I kept hearing this phrase outside the woods, Duncan, outside the woods, Duncan. And I thought, what, what is there? And what did I found? I found when I went there and when I went and did the research at the Couch and Historical Society, the name Paldi. Now, some of you will know Paldi because you're historians. Believe me, growing up, in BC. I came to Canada when I was a little girl. I've moved all across Canada. I grew up in New Westminster. As a kid in New Westminster, we never talked about the Komagata Maru. That was never taught to us. No one talked about it. We never talked about the fact that our high school was built on what was called a potter's field. 
basically an unclaimed cemetery. And guess who was in that cemetery? It was First Nations, South Asians, Japanese, and Chinese people. They put us all in there in that cemetery. It became very controversial in New Westminster. The New Westminster Senior Secondary is built on that. So that's how I grew up, right? I didn't know anything about Paldi. Paldi is one of the oldest towns in the historical register, I think from before 1906. It's a fascinating place. And I put it in my book because in the woods outside of Duncan is where the people who made the bomb that blew up Air India Flight 182, they made it in the woods outside of Duncan. And what I found so grotesque and fascinating was that Duncan is 14 miles next to this village, Paldi, which was a settler village of First Nations, Sikh Punjabi, I'm not Sikh or Punjabi, but Sikh Punjabi, and Japanese and Chinese workers and laborers, a lot of Japanese people. Uh, they weren't allowed to own land in Duncan. So this was the, the outside, right? What's allowed inside and outside. This was the outside town and it became, as many of you will know, a very successful logging town. Um, and then there's that whole ecological layer to it. So many layers in our history. So the village of Paldi was a very joyous, positive, multicultural, trail baking place. And it was kind of um, stained by the connection of some of the people to the town of Paldi to this bomb making. And I wanted to juxtapose those things and let the reader draw their own conclusions of what that means and what it doesn't mean. And it's not my place, I didn't think, to make meaning. That's for the reader. So I put it all in a poem. I put a lot of space in the poem for the absences. And a lot of the information I got was from these historical records, both official and unofficial. I hope to still write about Paldi. I just haven't gotten to it. I've got a lot to write about, but it really made an impact on me. And so in talking about my first book and my poetic practices, this is kind of your takeaway slide. It's suggesting to you as members as historians, as activists, as community historians, that keeping alive forgotten stories silence voices is an important witnessing role. If we didn't have local independent BC publishers such as mine, Nightwood Editions and Harbor Publishing, if we didn't have local booksellers, I hope that you go to places like Monroe's Books if you're on the island, Russell Books, Bolan Books, if you're in um, BC Book Warehouse, Black Bond Books, Massey Books, 100% Indigenous owned, uh, People's Co-op Bookstore, one of the oldest bookstores I think in Canada since 1942, um, 32 books in North Van and on and on. Support local bookstores, support local community and professional historians. and for poets, what I developed was this docu-poetics practice where a creative use of history is used as a method of redress. If most of history is written by those victorious in conquest, colonialism or imperialism, then poets like me working with people like you, we can fill in the blanks. That's the big takeaway. And I wanted to show you these books. So, in my research, right, it started with this little phrase in the woods outside of Duncan, and that's fate, that's karma. That spoke to me so powerfully that I made my husband book a ferry in 2011, and we went to Duncan and we went searching around for in the woods outside of Duncan. You know, I paced those woods. I went and visited the Sikh temple in Paldi. I met some amazing women, and they have written books, self published books. And their research led me to my research, and I've given you a little collage picture. These documents you see on the on well on my left, I don't know what side of the screen it is for you. These are all from the Cowichan Historical and Legislative Library, but mainly the Cowichan Historical Society upstairs in Duncan. There, um, 
uh, I spent a lot of hours there and the, the women, the ladies there were really lovely. I think they were a little like, who is this person? What is she doing here? But uh, I introduced myself and told them what I was doing. I actually got to meet two women that I want to tell you about. Joan Cameron Mayo, who you may know of. She was married to um, the Doman who founded uh, Doman Industries, you know, that have had such a pivotal impact on BC history through lumber and sawmills and timber and all the people they employed, the multicultural workforce they had. And another woman I met, Mahinder Kaur Doman Manhas, who's the editor of this book, Zindagi, which is selected stories of our first daughters. These are South Asian, mainly Punjabi Sikh, but not exclusively women who supported, worked, lived around and in the town of Paldi, which I believe is, I think there's a movement to get it designated a historical site. It really should be. There's not much left there. And of course, there are many complicated challenges there now where the descendants of some of these pioneer settler uh, South Asian and Japanese and Chinese families, their descendants want to build and develop and the local a more, you know, new pe newish people, they want to preserve everything and they don't want it to develop. Very interesting the way race and class play out in these historical patterns about which side you're on, you know, no judgment, no labels. It's very interesting. So that is, that is my story. And that is my call to action for you about um, history. And here's just another photo. I, I have so much I wanted to share with you, but I'm looking at the time and I'm going to move on. But that is the real, that's the seed I want to plant. You, all of you and your work helped me in what I did and in what Joan Mayo, she's just a phenomenal person and much has been written about her. You know, she's a Scottish, Irish, Canadian Joan Cameron Mayo, and she marries a dome and a South Asian Sikh Punjabi. Imagine, like in the 30s, and they go on to be this dynasty. Uh, everyone's heard about the domans in BC, and yeah, she's pretty remarkable. So here's another picture of that Fraserview Cemetery where my dad, born in Bombay, you know, finds his resting place. I know his spirit is everywhere. He died unexpectedly, and 2002. But um, I just put this slide to give you some of the backstory of um, this writing of this kind of writing I do. And not all poets do it. But since I've published my poem, there are a lot more poets who are doing this docu-poetics. And so here is this slide I wanted to show you where, well, what is it? You know, it's a sequence of elegies. It's a book length poem. It's a work of the imagination. It blends fact with fiction. It talks about personal loss and the official version of the public trauma. And so history um, made this book and this story. And I had to write my story back into history because it had been silenced and forgotten. So, whew, bit of a pause. It's so heavy. And I really should have done a trigger warning uh, when I talked about it. I just wanted us to have some time to contemplate what I'm saying. My hope for writers, readers, and researchers. Please be willing. Please consider to be willing to see how we are implicated by history, even if we are unaware, unwilling, or indifferent. I don't get it. I'm not interested. Oh, this isn't about me. Oh, they're just Indians. <laughs> Where are you from? What kind of Indian are you? You know the drill? How many times did I hear all of that growing up? And what I am asking myself as a settler, this is not about blame or shame. This is an invitation, a call to action that historians and people who dig around in history, whether you're a community or a professional historian, you have such an important role to create the archive that is inclusive and that honors and helps people who wanna tell these forgotten stories, silence voices. There's still a lot out there in Canadian history. Okay. All right. So 
as I published this book, this became my practice. And this is my little bookshelf. You can actually see it behind me here in real time. Just to give us a bit of a amuse-bosh, a, a mental break. That book and everything to do with that book, Children of Iranian, it put me on the literary map of Canada. It made me a kind of amateur historian. I really should join your groups. And, you know, it was about so much pain. And the, and the next book I want to share with you is a book of ecological pain, but also joy in that I got to collaborate with probably the world's leading honeybee scientist, Dr. Mark Winston. And there, my historical archive was about ecology, his scientific work, which is vast, that he gave me full and open access to. And this book, Listening to the Bees, zeroes in on, I think, a question that all historians have to grapple with. Who are we? And who do we want to be in the world? No pun on the bee. <laughs> and so this is just a little bit of introduction to the work. We took readers out into the laboratory, into the field through our writings. We combined Mark's essays um, on what's happening to bees by viewing the devastation wrought by overmanagement of agricultural and urban, urban habitats. And I wrote poems in response to that. He gives an insider's view of the way research is really conducted. And there's a whole appendix at the back of the book. It's full of really interesting historical insights in the way science, in this case, the science of the honeybee is conducted. And I was so blessed. I don't quite remember now how Mark and I connected, but he gave me full access to these archives. And so that's really the takeaway message um, the second big takeaway message, which is keep your archives, find funding, demand funding <laughs> from our governments, um, from our different departments and ministries to bolster and enrich your archives. Consider science archives and how they figure into history. Listening to the bees is many things, but one big strand is the history of honeybee science as practiced by Mark, and then my poetic responses. And we looked at um, the threat to bees, but also a celebration of how resilient they are. And we give really practical ideas of what people can do to help bees, like maybe consider uh, a messy garden rather than an absolutely pristine one with lots of hybrid and varietals that attract bees and that have pollen. So I'm not gonna read this poem, I'll let you look at it. I'm gonna encourage you, if you have a pen handy, to jot down this phone number, 1-833-1833-763-6748. It's Vancouver's first free poetry phone. There are 10 local poets, including myself, we're recorded reading these poems and it's a thanks to the Downtown Vancouver Business Association. So if you Google Vancouver Poetry Phone, you'll find bios and all 10 poets, including myself. You'll hear recordings if you don't wanna dial, but I hope you dial that number and I'm gonna, I'll put it in the chat after, or maybe Doug or Ishbel will, Ishbel has it written down in my biography. So Ishbel, maybe you can put it in the chat, one eight three three. In other words, it's a it's a free phone call, right? one 763 6748 Vancouver's first free poetry phone. And you can hear me reading this poem about the dance of the bees. Now, why have I selected this poem? Well, this really represents archival research. I accompanied Mark on his field research. I had access, thanks to him, to all of his archive of historical scientific records, some going back 40 years, very much historical process. And then I did what I do, right? This is my practice. I found words and language. These are verbatim notes, by the way, that I took from a presentation he did to the downtown east side one hot July day. And uh, 
each line of this poem is eight beats. And the idea is that the bees run or they dance, they don't run, they fly in, in the shape of a figure eight. And so I wanted to create a pattern of a figure eight. They communicate a lot of information about the angle of the sun, how much honey, where their worker bee sisters should go. It's unbelievable. They vibrate with their um, antenna. They, they lick and uh, taste each other to communicate information, really precise scientific information. That's what the bee does. It's unbelievable. And as a poet, I didn't know all this until I had access to a historical archive, in this case, the personal historical archive of Mark's papers, many of which are open access. So that's another takeaway message for all of you. Where possible, in addition to whatever membership fees you have to charge in order to do what you do, please consider as much open access as you can to your records and your documents, because that allows people, in my case, creatives, but of course, many other people to take what you do and share it with the world through our creative work. I hope it inspires you. So here I write down everything I'm saying. I'll just take a pause while I have a sip of tea and let you reflect, take some notes. Okay. And like I say, if you're interested in these slides, I can always send them to you. All right. So that brings us to my latest book where I take all of these interests and I put them all together in something I've been working on for 10 years. It's an epic fantasy in verse. And I just wanna do a little bit of a deep dive summarizing everything I've introduced you to. First I though, I wanna start with this incredible artwork. Again, the artist's name is Nadina Tandy. She's a Gibson artist. Um, like me, she is a settler Canadian of, what did she tell me? Irish, English, Swedish, I forget all her background. She's a really amazing person. If you Google Nadina Tandy, T-A-N-D-Y, like the famous actress, Jessica Tandy, I don't know if they're related, um, you'll find her work. And I fell in love with her work. My publisher, Nightwood Editions, independent local BC publisher, um, who publishes my work, um, they introduced me to her when we were thinking of what was the artwork we wanted for my book cover. And so my epic fantasy series is called The Heart of This Journey Bears All Patterns. And book one of this series is Brahma and the Beggar Boy. Brahma is a locksmith, brown, brave, and beautiful, and she's a time traveler. And she is living in a dystopian futuristic world dominated by the evil consortium, a powerful global economic agro-industrial military complex. Sound familiar? <laughs> and um, she adopts orphans and outcasts and she adopts this beggar boy who has a mysterious origin as to Brahma. That will become clear if you buy the book. And um, they time travel to help save the planet and they join up with a band of resistors who are seed savers. I think of all historians as seed savers, by the way. We're all seed savers if we wanna save this planet. And what role can history play? So you will see the bullet points here. I, I bring all my interests together, language and lexicons of language, history, especially the stories in history that are forgotten, made invisible, silence, the underdog stories, told slant, right? I, this isn't historical work, it's a work of the imagination, but there is so much history. I did so much research. The history of locksmithing, the history of making and seed saving and science, I put it all in here. Uh, I'm really interested in the unknown, the anonymous, the under-recognized, not part of the official record. And I think this is where historical associations such as your own 
I know you're a federation. So all your member organizations, this is you, right? You guys are saving records that might not be kept by the bigger official document keepers. So your archives become so important. A little example, which is a side example to my made up story. As I mentioned to you, my father is one of the first South Asian United Church ministers. Now the United Church, we have such a fractured history through truth and reconciliation. The United Church, you know, was very implicated like all our mainline churches in, in uh, these Indian residential schools. So the United Church archives of the Pacific Conference, it used to be called the BC Presbytery, we have so many archives that include Indigenous and First Nations archives, and we're working with the UBC Indian Residential Schools History and Dialogue Center. Now, those archives and those historical records are unbelievable. They give tours. I really recommend people do it as part of our own responsibility through Truth and Reconciliation. But the United Church Archives, I'm on the board, they also have the archives of folks like my dad. Like my unsung mother, you know, brown woman, middle class, comes to Canada, doesn't know anything for anything. Mar uh, she's married to this man who converts to Christianity. He takes her all over the country. She's a United Church minister's wife. My mom, her forgotten story, it's all in the archives. And one day, hopefully, I don't know if it'll be me, but someone will go and research these South Asians who happen to become Christians who traveled all over Canada through the United Church. Those stories would never be known for the future if there wasn't an archive, thank God there is, that keeps things. I've gone into the United Church archives in Manitoba and Saskatchewan, where my, where my dad was a minister in Saskatchewan. I've sat for hours in the local archives, looking at things like the annual reports of churches and just how much information for good and for bad are in those. So I'm always asking myself in my practice, certainly in this big, huge, epic fantasy, what's missing? What is my creative response to the silencing of untold truths? And so I use invention, imagination, speculative fiction and fantasy, but I use a lot of history. This crazy office I'm sitting in, I have boxes and boxes of historical data and documents. So this is just another visual image from the book from Nadina's art. And it just gives you a slide sort of explaining what I've been talking about. I, I won't read it verbatim, you can take a look at it. But one of the set of characters I have are these aunties. Some of them are brown, some of them are all different cultures, and they foretell the future. And they teach survival skills, such as seed saving, soap and glass making. Yeah, just think about the importance of soap making if you're in a pandemic, and you're in a dystopian dark ages. It's really important to know how to make soap. There are no antibiotics, there are no vaccines. So you got to stay safe, you got to mask, you got to make masks, and you have to know how to make soap. Soap is about the only thing that will kill a lot of viruses. Um, so I weave all this into this epic fantasy. I've done so much historical research. Uh, and then, of course, the challenge as a poet is to make it story, right? All right. So I'm going to read this poem just to give you a sense of how history and science and research can be put into a poem. And those of you who are kind of into these things, you'll see that the first part of the poem one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. 12, 13, 14. Yep, that would be a sonnet. Okay, here it goes. Brand new, coming in July, resistance song. You can hear the sky train in the background. I'm just waiting for it to pass. At the year's midnight, we sighed, heads bent to perimeter where oracles foretold colony collapse. Our anti-saving mason bees, small finds in handmade glass jars. Wildfires in November, ash mixed with ice, are dry, our skin dry and cracked, scalps covered in lice, gray skies unending, snow drought extending. Sala leaves withering, their spines snapped in two. 
At Tower Juniper, rentalsmen stood ready to accept payment for shelter. We bartered our daughters, we sold our boys, Wi-Fi on ration, our androids, no toys. Toxic alert on high. We ached for green. Who would have thought of us standing unseen? Mind those drones, they'll break your bones. Hide and sweep, duck and swerve. Watch us learn these raindrops burn. Such an honor to be able to share poetry at a historical society conference. So what you've just heard, you know, is rhymed poetry. I kind of wanted to bring that back. And um, the condensing of years of reading about all the things you can guess at that I've been talking at you about, you know, I've condensed it all into the sonnet and then this little ballad fragment. I hope you enjoy it. There's a, I have a reader's notes in the back of the book. I've got timelines. It gives you a, a sense, I think, if you're interested in history of uh, what I have looked at to create this fantasy world. If you have heard of the Game of Thrones and George R. R. Martin or Tolkien, of course, um, and The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings, there are certainly influences in how I've constructed this kind of eco-warning fable tale, you will know that a lot of fantasy writers, we go deep into history and we access a lot of history. So there we are. Thank you. Gratitude to this conference and all local BC historians. Gratitude to local BC independent publishers, booksellers, artists and designers. My book is available on July 17th. I hope you check it out. But more importantly, let's connect. I welcome your comments and questions. You can email me at writerrs at outlook.com. You can find me on social media. Maybe we'll just keep this slide up for a few moments because I would just love to connect with you. And maybe there's a few questions. Mm -hmm.